All right, welcome back. How's everybody doing? Um, uh, just so in case you notice or are distracted, yeah, there's some, my eyes a little messed up. I got a bug in it and rubbed the bug in there, and having a little bit of an allergic reaction. It's a little bit red and swollen. No biggie. Um, just don't want you to be distracted by that. Uh, what I want you to do is focus on today's topic, which is using a GPS in GIS. And you've probably used GPS a bunch by now. You probably use it, don't even realize that you're using it. Um, but I want you to understand the basics behind how the GPS system works and how we're going to incorporate that into ArcGIS. So what is GPS? That stands for the Global Positioning System. It's a way for finding out the coordinates of a point on Earth. You'll remember and, and it uses satellites to find these coordinates on Earth. You remember that I've said a hundred times now that all GIS data requires a spatial reference. It requires coordinates. It needs to be geo-referenced. This is often the way we're going to geo-reference those data is by using a GPS. For biologists, we're primarily going to use GPS in a couple of ways. One way is that we're going to load in some sample sites and we're going to have to go out and find those sample sites using the GPS. Or we're going to be out in the field and we're going to need to be able to figure out our way back home. So by finding our way to and from a place, well, this is just the same thing as you know, this is what Google Maps is doing, right? Only you're going to be doing it in the field. Another way that you're going to use it more, more often is that you're going to record data in the field and at the same time you're going to use that GPS to record the coordinates where you're taking those data. So you're going to be at a point and maybe you're going to, maybe it's a bunch of plants that you want to study and so every time you find that plant you want to make a GPS coordinate of that so that you can go map them. Maybe it's just I'm going to record the canopy cover at a bunch of points. Or I'm on a lake and I'm going to measure the depth of the water at a bunch of points. Or I'm taking a soil sample or a water sample and I'm going to take it back to the lab and analyze it. And I just want to record the coordinates where I took that sample. Or I'm going to take the temperature or the rainfall or anything. I'm at a point, I'm recording data at this point and I also need the coordinates, that's what my GPS is going to give me. Then I pull all this back into the software and I can analyze it. All that data that you record along with those points, those become features. And those are going to show up in the attribute table in the ArcGIS software. Okay, so how does that handheld unit tell your coordinates at a given point? There's about 24 or so satellites orbiting the Earth. Sometimes they get old and they drop out. Sometimes new ones go in, but there's a bunch of them. And they are circling the whole globe and they are not geosynchronous. So geosynchronous means the satellite is at a given distance from the Earth that it orbits the Earth at exactly the same rate that the Earth spins. Consequently, a geosynchronous satellite appears to stay in one position in the sky. And so if you talk about things like your satellite TV, you know, you point that dish at a, at a spot somewhere kind of over Texas, and then you never have to move that dish because the satellite rotates as the Earth rotates, so the satellite seems to never move in the sky. That is geosynchronous. The GPS satellites are not geosynchronous. They are moving in the sky. And they do this in such a way they're timed and they're coordinated so that there's always should be several satellites overhead at any point in time on any date, at least here in North America. So to get your location you need to have satellites overhead and this is a way of ensuring that there's always going to be good satellite coverage so there's always you should be able to get uh, GPS coordinates. Okay well how do those satellites that are moving in the sky how are they able to tell me where I'm standing on earth? It's actually pretty straightforward and pretty simple. 
All they do is broadcast a radio wave of a particular frequency, and it's less like any other radio wave like you might listen to on your car radio or your cell phone tower. It, they just broadcast a particular radio wave. And that radio wave has a little bit of information encoded in it. Now that GPS unit you have in your hand is just a receiver. It's just like another, like a radio in your car or like your cell phone. It can detect and receive and, and understand those particular wavelengths of uh, electromagnetic radiation. So it can read those radio waves and it can decode them and get the information from them. Well the information that's in that radio wave is just when did this radio signal leave the satellite? At what time did that signal leave the satellite? The handheld knows when it received that signal. And so the signal itself says, hey, I left at such and such a time. The handheld knows, hey, the signal got here at such and such a time. You know that that signal travels at the speed of light. So you know the speed. So if you know when it left, and you know when it got here, and you know how fast it traveled, you know the distance from your point to that satellite. Or the GPS receiver knows from this receiver to that satellite is X number of kilometers based upon all this information. And so with that information, you know how far you are from a given satellite, you can use that to figure out your coordinates. Let's give a simple example here. Again, this is very straightforward um, example of calculating distance, right? If, you left, if I left my house at 745, I got a daycare at 810, I averaged 30 miles per hour, how far away is the daycare? Well, you can do this. This is very simple math, right? It takes you 25 minutes at 30 miles per hour. So then you can work backwards and say, okay, I'm exactly 12 and a half miles from the daycare. Well, it's the same thing with the satellite. If you know when the radio signal left and you know when it got here and you know how fast it took, to, how fast it was traveling, then you know how far you are from that satellite. Awesome. Only thing here is we're talking things that travel at the speed of light, which is really fast, right? We're talking very short times. Even though it's a very long distance from here to that satellite, traveling at the speed of light, it does not take long to get here. Fractions of a second. So you need a very precise clock so that you can measure how long it takes for that signal to move. And the GPS satellites have atomic clocks in them, which are very precise clocks. Um, it turns out that certain atoms vibrate at a constant rate. And so if you know this, and you have that atom, you can build a clock that is very precise, because it's based upon the vibration of an atom. Excuse me, so you can measure fractions of a second very precisely. And so since the Satellite has the atomic clock. It can tell you very precisely when that signal left. Your GPS does not have an atomic clock in it, but it is synchronized with the satellite's atomic clock. So it can use the same clock. So your GPS handheld can tell very precisely when the signal got here. And so it can very accurately calculate how long it took that signal to go from the receiver, from the satellite to the receiver, it knows how fast it traveled. Thus, it can tell you very precisely how close you are to that satellite. Well, I know how far I am from a satellite. That still does not give me latitude longitude. That still does not give me my coordinates. So how do I get those coordinates? Well, let's just say, assume that you know your distance R1 from a point, okay? Now, in this example, how do we know we're R1 from a point? Again, I just told you how. Because the satellite broadcasts the radio wave, and you know how long it talk, took to get here, and you know how fast it's traveling, you know how far you are from a given satellite. So from my GPS unit, I know I'm distance R1 from a satellite. At the same time, let's put another satellite up, or another point. 
Simultaneously, I know that I'm distance R2 from point 2, right? And again, there's multiple satellites up there, but either way, if I know I'm distance R1 from point 1, and distance R2 from point 2, which is a little bit farther away, then you know that you're sitting on, one, on both of these circles, right? If I'm distance R1 from point 1, I'm somewhere on that first circle. And if I'm distance R2 from point 2, I'm somewhere on that second larger circle. But I know that I am both R1 from point 1 and R2 from point 2, so I have to be where those two circles intersect. Those are the only two points that satisfy both criteria. I must be at either one of those points, because those are the only two points that are both R1 from point 1 and R2 from point 2. See how that works? Well, you can probably imagine where this is going. What if or, or, you know, I still have one of two points, right? How do I decide which of those two points is where I'm actually standing? Well, you can probably figure that out. You need a third satellite that will tell you which of those two points is the correct point. And so, at the same time, I know I'm distance R3 from point 3. So, again, I'm somewhere on this circle that surrounds point R3, or that, that surrounds point 3, and the circle is distance R3 from point 3. And so what point is simultaneously distance R1 from point 1, distance R2 from point 2, and distance R3 from point 3? it has to be the point that I'm indicating right here. That's the only point that satisfies all those three conditions. So that is how, if I know my distance from multiple points, then I can tell exactly where I am relative to those points. And the only difference here with the satellite is what I just showed you was in two dimensions. A satellite is in three dimensions, and so instead of circles around a point, um, I am on a sphere surrounding a point. And so I need four satellites, not three. I needed three satellites to find my position in two-dimensional space. I need four satellites to find my position in three-dimensional space. And again, it's just because I know that I'm a certain distance from each of these satellites, so I'm somewhere on a sphere surrounding each of those satellites where all those spheres intersect must be the one point that satisfies all those conditions. And that one point is somewhere on the Earth and that's how I know where I am on the Earth. And so this is just an example again. Again, if I'm distance R from this first satellite, And my receiver tells me I'm also such and such distance from a second satellite. I must be on the sphere, if I back up, if I'm distance R from this satellite, you imagine a sphere around that satellite, I must be somewhere on that sphere. By the same token, if I have a second satellite and I know the distance to that satellite, I'm somewhere on that sphere too. So where these two spheres intersect, is you know, I'm somewhere in that circle. I have a third satellite. Now I must be where all three spheres intersect. And they all three intersect at only one of two points. There's only two points in the whole universe that are these distances from these satellites. And if I get that fourth satellite, and I know I'm the distance from that satellite too, I can pick which point I should be at. So with four satellites, I know, and I know the distance that I am right now from those four satellites, that narrows it down to tell me exactly where I am in three-dimensional space. And then I just you know, have to apply coordinates to that, and that's how you get the coordinates from a GPS unit. 
So it's pretty cool. It's it's fairly simple, you know, launching satellites and building atomic clocks. That's not really simple, but the idea is pretty simple. Okay, so consequently, the minimum number of satellites you have to have to get accurate coordinates is four. But in reality, you need to have a lot more than four satellites locked in. So this is why we always want to have multiple satellites over our head. Four would do it, but sometimes, you know, you lose and regain signal from satellites. You know, I mean, you are detecting a signal from space, so it's not perfect. And so if you only had four locked in and then one dropped out, now you can't accurately tell your, your location. And so for practical reasons, we want many, many satellites locked in so we can drop a couple three and still have our minimum of four. Um, but all, all receivers today do that. And, and if you look, we'll look later when we're working with GPS units and you can see how many satellites you're locked on. And usually these days you're locked on to eight, 10 satellites at any one time. But this also has to do with how many satellites are over your head at a given time. And in some places of the globe, you might not have good satellite coverage. And so you might not get the minimum number of satellites. Now, so that's it. That's the basic idea. But there is some error, okay? You are detecting signals from space, and as good as it is, there's some error, but we can identify those errors and correct for them to get better coordinates. Um, the first source of error is atmospheric disturbance. Uh, there's a layer of the atmosphere called the ionosphere that has a lot of charged particles. And so you have this electromagnetic wave flowing through an atmosphere of charged particles that's going to disrupt it and deflect the signal. And you can't predict how it's going to influence those. If you could predict how the atmosphere was going to influence those, then you could just build that into your formula and it'd be no big deal. But you can't. So you know that when that signal is coming from that satellite, it's deflected a little bit before it gets to you. So it actually probably travels a little farther than what you expect because it kind of bounces around, all right? But you can't predict that. There's also something called multipath, which is very similar, but it's down here on Earth. And that's when a signal bounces off something and then gets to your receiver. So if you're standing next to a tall building, that signal might bounce off that building and get to your receiver. So again, it's taken a little bit longer path to get to you. So your GPS unit thinks that you are farther from the satellite than you truly are. And if you're around trees or anything, those multipath signals um, will all take longer to get to you than they should. And so you think you're farther away than you are, and so that introduces error. And again, that's unpredictable. So multipath is just a signal bouncing off things here on Earth. So what we need is something called differential correction. Differential correction is a way of acknowledging those sources of error and trying to correct them to improve your accuracy. Now, I said both of these are unpredictable, so how can we correct for them? I'm gonna show you here in a second. Understand that multipath, you cannot correct for multipath. There's no way to fix that error because multipath is totally dependent upon what you're standing next to, and, and there's no way for the GPS to, to really understand that and account for that. And so when you're around trees, when you're around tall buildings, you know you're not getting as good a signal. And there's nothing you can do about that except to get away from the trees and the tall buildings. So that stinks for uh, forest ecologists, right? Because uh, if you're working in the woods and there's lots of leaves on the trees and that, you're not gonna get a very good signal. And so GPS does not work as well. A lot of times then, if you wanna work in a forest ecosystem, you got to do it in the winter when the leaves are off, but you're still going to get some multipath. But the atmospheric disturbance, although we can't predict for it, we can figure out a way to account for it. And that's differential correction. 
And the way this works is you have several base stations. Just places scattered all over the planet that have known coordinates. So it's just a little station and you already know the coordinates for that station. So you don't need GPS to tell you the coordinates, you have the coordinates for this area. But this is a receiver, it's, it's a GPS receiver and it is uh, getting the same signals your handheld unit's getting. And based upon those signals, it comes up with a set of coordinates where it thinks you are, you know, where the base station knows where it thinks it is based upon the signal you're getting, but of course it already knows where it is. It already knows its coordinates. And so it compares the inaccurate coordinates it's getting from the satellite to the known coordinates and it can come up with a correction factor that you can be used to improve the accuracy of other GPS units. So why, why is the satellite data you know, inaccurate? Because of that atmospheric disturbance. And we don't know how that atmospheric disturbance is, is affecting us, but we know that it is affecting us. But if we know where you know, our known coordinates, we can figure out how much error is in there and we can correct that error and get better GPS signal. So that base station gets that correction factor and then broadcasts it out. So your handheld unit is not only is receiving the radio signal from the satellite to get, you know, pretty good coordinates but not super accuracy, but it's also getting a correction factor that it applies that will give it much better accuracy. That's differential correction. So again, here's a schematic example of that. Here's our base station that has known latitude longitude. Well, how do we know the latitude longitude of the site? You know, other methods. There are other ways to find it. Um, it doesn't make any sense to use the GPS to get the coordinates of this because we're trying to correct GPS. But so these are stations that have been surveyed that we know the exact coordinates exactly where they are on the planet. And so there's a receiver at this base station and the receiver is collecting satellite signals that tell us that its location is over here uh, where the red X is. So that's, you know, the base station knows that's not correct. Now this changes from day to day based upon what's going on in the atmosphere. So that red X is constantly moving around but that's the beauty of this is no matter what, the base station knows its own coordinates. And so um, this error is due to the atmosphere. There might be some multipath, but these base stations are put out in the open, so there's really no multipath error. This is error just due to atmospheric disturbance. And so the distance between the known coordinates and what it thinks the coordinates are, that's the correction factor. That's how the atmosphere is influencing GPS at this point in time. And so if we take that correction factor and send it out to all GPS units in the vicinity, they can apply that correction factor, which is affecting them too, and they can get much more precise um, and or much more accurate and precise coordinates. Again, does this help with multipath? It does not. And so, if you're anywhere near tall buildings, tall trees, multipath is going to influence the accuracy of your coordinates, and you need to be aware of that. Okay, um, just some basics about differential correction. You need to have it. Um, it's usually abbreviated DGPS. So, if you see that, that means differentially corrected GPS. The old school way they used to send out that correction factor was over a, a, a radio signal, a land-based radio signal. So super old GPS units would have a big antenna like you used to see on cars. Um, and that was the early version of, D, of DGPS and that would get your accuracy to within about 10 meters or so. But you just don't see this anymore. If you see this, it's an old system and you wanna get a newer system. The new system uses something called WAS, which stands for the Wide Area Augmentation System. And this sends the correction factor through the satellites. So you don't need an extra antenna. Your GPS already has an antenna that's tuned into the satellites. 
So they just send the correction factor over those same satellites. So the satellite is not only telling you how far you are from the satellite, it's also telling you how to correct for atmospheric disturbance at your location. And so this ends up being much more accurate. And so a WAS-enabled GPS um, will get you from within one to three meter accuracy on average. That's pretty good for an ecologist. The way I think about it, that's a boat length for me, right? And so that's um, fairly decent accuracy. But you can get even more accurate through various means. One way to get more accuracy is something called post-processing. Post-processing is when you record the signal in the field and the data are recorded and then you wash that data through a program in the computer that applies algorithms that apply even more correction that is, you know, in case your GPS is not capable of doing, and that gets you down to, you know, sub centimeter accuracy, which is incredible, which means you could go out into a field and you could drop a dime and mark that dime with your GPS and then come back a year later and find that dime. You got that kind of accuracy. Um, now, you know, that's pretty good accuracy, but you got, I think at some point, the human factor becomes important too, right? My, I mean, if I drink coffee, my hand shakes more than one centimeter accuracy, but you get the idea. It's, it's very possible to get very precise coordinates and accurate coordinates with the GPS and post-processing. Okay. Well, what are you going to be working with here? I kind of look at GPS receivers as low end versus high end. There seems to be like two markets out there. The low end are cheaper. They don't have a ton of features. They're smaller, but they have pretty decent accuracy. Um, if you get a really cheap one, if you buy a GPS and it's like super cheap, like 25 bucks, it probably does not have differential correction and it's not worth it. Um, you need to buy a unit that has differential correction, and they're not that expensive. Most today will use WAS for differential correction, which gets them down to one to three meter accuracy for less than 150 bucks, really less than 100 bucks. You can get a, a receiver that will give you that kind of accuracy. Um, the high end, the other market is for, often for engineers, um, people that want really, really that want that sub centimeter accuracy, and now we're talking five thousand bucks, probably up to twenty, thirty thousand dollars. You're talking big dollar. They're larger. They have more features, but they have that extraordinary accuracy. And so there's kind of a dichotomy. There's really, um, you know, two main markets here that I I notice. Um, also, you know, your cell phone comes GPS enabled and a lot of people use their cell phones. Um, the cell phone accuracy is not terrible, but I don't know if you want to use a cell phone for collecting field data. The accuracy, um, they, they are often differentially corrected. They sometimes are not and they use uh, Wi-Fi towers, which are, you know, have known coordinates, or uh, they use Wi-Fi and cell phone towers. The cell phone towers for sure have known coordinates, and they can get somewhere in between. I think what I found said that cell phones are about eight meter accuracy, so that's not terrible. So the brand names that you're going to run into most of the time are Garmin and Trimble. There are others out there, but for the low end, usually the handhelds are Garmin, and they're really good. And for the high end, the company is Trimble, and they make some good stuff too. Um, so just be aware of that. For ecologists, biologists, what do you need? Usually the Garmin handheld is plenty good. The bang for the buck is, in, is kind of in the sweet spot there, right? Usually one to three meter accuracy is plenty good for ecologists, but you gotta think about what you're working on. Again, you always want to look for WAS enabled GPS that's just common enough and it's inexpensive enough that there's no reason to not get that. And that'll get you within three meters. And for ecology, that's usually pretty good. But you got to be aware that you got to turn that on. And they usually ship with WAS turned off. 
And if you don't ever go in and turn it on, then you're not getting differentially corrected uh, coordinates and your accuracy is more like 10 meters. The rule is just get the best you can afford, but think about what kind of accuracy you need. Right? How often do you need sub-center accuracy? And if you're in, in a situation where you might need that, then you probably need to you know, spend the money for a Trimble. But most of the time, a handheld GPS, a Garmin for 100 bucks, will get you the accuracy you need. Um, now, cell phones, they, there's all kinds of good GPS apps. If anybody has a good app that they would suggest, send it to me. Uh, there's one called Trimble Outdoors that I use on my cell phone. Again, this is more for finding your areas for quick and dirty location. It's not as accurate as the Garmin, but sometimes you don't, you, you just, if you're, especially if you're just trying to find your way around, the cell phone will work. Um, realize that sometimes when you're out in the field, you don't have good cell tower coverage. And so if you want a base map, like a topographic map or something, you won't be able to download it because you don't have cell phone coverage. So, but you can, if you know where you're going, you can pre-download it so that you still have that base map when you're out in the field. Um, there's also a program called Arc, or excuse me, called Collector, which is an app that Esri puts out, and we can set this up so that you can go out and collect data in the field using your cell phone. And so I could set up a project, and each of you could put this app on your phone and go out and collect data and all your data will automatically load into my project and by the time you get back to the office we have all the data already in to ArcMap and we can work with it. It's pretty slick. Okay, last thing we need to talk about is best practices. We've talked about the different um, you know, high-end versus low-end GPS. Whatever GPS you got there are a few things you need to do to make sure you get your best accuracy. First off, turn on DGPS. You only have to do this once. Once you turn it on, it stays on. But most of the time, it doesn't come shipped. It doesn't ship with it turned on. So go look for it and turn it on. And it takes a little bit longer for the differential correction to kick in. So when you first turn on the GPS, you're not getting differentially corrected coordinates. So you usually want to turn on your GPS, drink a cup of coffee. Maybe it didn't take that long, but give it a few minutes until you see that it is actually using differential correction before you start collecting data. The antenna is built in, usually it's at the top and usually you want to point it up. So instead of having it uh, you know, laying twisted, point it up, you usually can get a little bit better signal. Avoid multipath, so try to avoid leaves, buildings to the best you can, right? If you're working in the forest, there's only so much you can do. Um, standing still or setting the GPS down and leaving it for a while often can give you better coordinates because the longer it sits there, uh, they usually have something called signal averaging, which work takes the signals and um, gets you better and better, better accuracy. Um, so if you really want to get a very accurate point, you often will just set the GPS down for a while and then come back and then mark your point and you get the best accuracy. So the longer you wait, the better your accuracy usually. And I mentioned signal averaging, which sometimes it happens to some degree automatically, but also, for example, on the Garmin's, there is a feature where you can tell it to average the signal and it will give you a countdown until it feels like it has as the maximum accuracy it can give you and then it'll save the point. And if you really, really want good accuracy, you need a unit that will allow you to do post-processing. And that's your more expensive units, your trimbles and that. And you usually have to go back into your office and wash that signal through a computer program to get that really accurate uh, GPS location. Um, for biologists, there are several things that, that we, you know, we're going to talk about that you need to know. How to set up your GPS, which means turning on the differential correction, setting it to record things in decimal degrees, stuff like that. Just basic stuff. How to read it, how to make points on the computer and upload them to the GPS so that you can go find those points in the field. Um, when you go and collect points and tracks, 
how to download those to the computer so you can put them into ArcGIS, how to find known points, how to mark unknown points, uh, how to improve accuracy. These are all the skills we want you to know. Now, this has been talking about using a GPS to find coordinates, something that we mentioned before and I'll mention again. Sometimes you want coordinates of a location, but you don't want to have to walk all the way out there and stand there with a GPS. And often you can just get the coordinates from a point when you're sitting at your computer. And I showed you how to do this in a previous example, so go back and look at the uh, earlier lectures. But you can use ArcMap, Google Maps, also Google Earth. You can find a place, a picture of a place, and click on a particular location, and it will tell you the coordinates of that location. And that can be very useful in a lot of situations, so you don't have to go out and actually collect the points by standing there. Another way to get points um, without standing, to get the coordinates of a point without standing at that point is to use a laser offset, which this is pretty slick. I have one of these. And so you can stand out in the field and you've got a GPS unit and usually takes a trimble. And that trimble tells you exactly, it knows the coordinates of where you're standing, just like any GPS unit would. But then you could take a laser range finder which is a very accurate way of determining your distance to other points on the ground. And it also, has, you can get one with a compass built into it and a tilt sensor. And so, say there's a tree over here, I can take that laser range finder and I can use the laser to find out that I'm exactly so many meters from that tree. But I also know that that tree is at a certain angle from where I'm standing and at a certain distance up and down and all that can feed into the computer and since I know or the, the, the trimble the handheld since I know the coordinates where I'm at now and I know that that point is so many meters away at such an angle at and such an elevation it can calculate the coordinates of that point without walking over there so I can stand in one point and use that laser to just mark things all around me and get their coordinates without having to move. Pretty slick. Um, okay, so that is just sort of the basics. I really want you to just have a broad understanding of how GPS works and how to use the thing. And so later on we're going to be taking files from the GPS, putting them into the software, working with them. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. That's all I have for right now, so we'll see you later. Have a great day.